second division championship trophy belongs to Reading. 89 points from 46 games made the Royals the champions. The supporters turned out in force on a dismal evening to pay tribute to Mark McGee and his squad at the end of a glorious season. Welcome to Elm Park in May 1994. We're here for a celebration at the end of a championship winning season. I've been privileged to follow Reading this season on behalf of Meridian Broadcasting, witnessing some great goals, some memorable football. Well, the campaign which led to this day began last August. The Royals on the road, destination Huddersfield. The previous season, Reading needed six matches to record their first win. This time, they clicked on day one. Michael Jilks had settled his contractual differences and ripped Huddersfield apart. The first goal belonged to Mick Gooding. Reading had new fullbacks, Ray Ranson and Dylan Kerr. Kerr involved with Jilks in setting up the second for Jimmy Quinn. Quinn celebrated, but there was only despair for goalkeeper Steve Francis. He'd left Elm Park in favour of Huddersfield. When Jilks, at his best, raced through to provide a third for Stuart Lovell, it appeared the keeper's move had backfired. Northampton were Reading's first round opponents in the Coca-Cola Cup. After 54 minutes from Dylan Kerr's corner, Jimmy Quinn hit the target. Michael Jilks hit the accelerator on the left-hand side and supplied the centre for Stuart Lovell to head the second. Tom Jones and Ray Ranson carved out the third. Lovell dummied and Phil Parkinson added the finish to give Reading a comfortable lead for the second leg. Burnley, among the pre-season favourites for promotion, were Reading's first league opponents at Elm Park. From Phil Parkinson centre, Jimmy Quinn made it three goals in three games. Skipper Keith McPherson headed his only goal of the season to make it 2-0. Macker to his teammates had signed a two-year contract with Reading before the kickoff. David Ayres pulled one back for Burnley, but Reading had six points from two league games. Reading's first defeat was at Brentford. Hundreds of Royals fans travelled up the M4, some were locked out. Joe Allen nipped in for the only goal of the game. Newly promoted Barnet were September's first visitors. Mick Gooding made his mark after only three minutes. Barnet drew level with a header from Kelly Haag but the celebrations at the visitors' end were premature. From Stuart Lovell's centre, Phil Parkinson headed Reading back in front. In the second half, from Michael Jilk's centre, Jimmy Quinn scored with a great header. Reading made the most of plenty of space to play in. Another Jilk centre was met by Lovell. Only the keeper's reflexes denied him. Reading did get a fourth. From Quinn's header, Jilks rolled in one of the softest goals of the season. It was a convincing victory. Marred, though, when Tom Jones suffered a broken leg near the end. Jones, who'd only been on the field a few minutes, was caught by Kelly Hard. It was the second time in less than a year his right leg had been broken. Jones was to miss five months of the season as a result of this challenge. It was cruel luck on the midfield player. 
I've got absolutely no doubt that Tom Jones will come back and be an important part of our, our, our season, even this season. Um, but certainly in the seasons beyond as well. Tom Jones is a player that can play at a higher level. Tom Jones can play in the first division and we intend to be in the first division next year. So, it, you know, it's unfortunate he wasn't in the team. He's came on for a short period, got injured, and now he's likely to be out by Christmas. But he'll be back after that. And as I say, he's, he's got a future at Reading beyond uh, the Christmas and beyond this season. Cambridge were Reading's next visitors. Their defence was unlocked by this Mick Gooding pass and this lethal Jimmy Quinn finish. Dylan Kerr's powerful forward runs were fast becoming a feature at Elm Park. His shot was only just too high. At the other end, Shaka Hislop was ready when required. In the second half, Quinn's shot was too hot for the keeper to handle competently and Phil Parkinson was on hand to tap in Reading second. A third goal followed as Reading swept forward with devastating efficiency. Stuart Lovell cleverly left the ball for Kerr and his deep centre was chased and caught by Mick Gooding. Who else would be ready to finish at the far post? Quinn's first double of the season. Cambridge weren't completely finished. Steve Claridge squeezed the ball past his lock to make the final score. Reading 3, Cambridge 1. Reading took their three-goal cushion to the county ground Northampton for the second leg of their Coca-Cola Cup tie. And their advantage was four when substitute Andy Gray scored on the stroke of half-time. Kevin Dillon started and finished the move which brought the only goal of the second half. Stuart Lovell and Scott Taylor were also involved on the right before Dillon's finish carried Reading forward 5-0 on aggregate, 2-0 on the night. Of the three Welsh clubs in Division 2, Wrexham were Reading's first opponents and they went ahead when Shaka Hislop was beaten by Wayne Phillips. Wrexham then had striker Steve Watkins sent off for lashing out at the Royals ex-Welsh international Jeff Hopkins. It looked as though the match would swing in Reading's favour when Barry Jones turned the ball into his own goal to make it one all. But just before half-time, his lock didn't reach this centre and Gary Bennett scored a simple goal. In the second half, Shaka had no chance when Michael Lake's free kick took a deflection to make it 3-1. The Royals scored again when Michael Gilt's centre was skillfully tapped away by Stuart Lovell. A disappointing day, though, for the Royals. Frank Stapleton's Bradford were another club fancy to survive among the second division's front runners. But Bill Parkinson gave Reading the lead. In the second half, the speed of Michael Jilts brought Reading a second. Stuart Lovell made no mistake at the far post. Jimmy Quinn fired in a penalty against his former club. And when Bradford keeper Paul Tomlinson fluffed his clearance, he could hardly have picked a better target for the Royals fans. Jimmy Quinn second made it 4-0. Sean McCarthy, later to join Oldham's Premiership struggle, pulled two back for the Yorkshiremen, but this was a notable success for the Royals. Peter Shilton's Plymouth attracted the first 6,000-plus league gate of the season to Elm Park, and there was no shortage of drama. Stuart Lovell's sharp header gave Jimmy Quinn an opportunity to nudge Reading in front. But after half-time, the West Countryman drew level. Kevin Nugent, the scorer. Reading's passing game was at its best as Mick Gooding took the ball in his stride and finished with a flourish. Plymouth weren't finished, though, and from a penalty, Steve Castle made it 2 all. With time running out, Reading produced a memorable finish. Michael Jilks laid the ball into the path of Quinn. 
Reading's followers would become accustomed to Quinn's magnificent finishing, but he struck few better than this. Perfect timing to give Reading three more points. And so, after playing eight league matches, Reading lay third with 18 points, just one behind leaders Hull City and Stockport, Bournemouth fourth, Plymouth fifth. Mark McGee satisfied, particularly with that finish against Plymouth. Plymouth played very well that day, as did we, and uh, we pinched it in the last couple of minutes, as you see, with a terrific goal from uh, Jimmy Quinn, a tremendous finish. It's one that you see over and over again when we're talking about the season, I'm sure. Um, it was a good goal and a, and a fitting way to win an exciting, competitive match. In mid-September, Ray Ranson was struggling with a knee injury. Particularly poor timing for the fullback as Reading had been drawn against his former club, Manchester City, in the Coca-Cola Cup. Ranson relished the prospect of a return to Main Road. You know, it's a funny coincidence that uh, we draw them in the cup and have a lot of uh, you know, very good memories from the club and uh, having played back in the Premier League with them last year, I'm really looking forward to it. Unfortunately for Ranson, he wasn't fit enough to make Reading's lineup for the first leg. With protests intensifying against City's then chairman, Peter Swales, a crowd boycott meant that only 9,000 saw Reading at Main Road. City struck first with Niall Quinn finding David White. Problems here. White's acceleration brings the first goal of the game. The longer the game went on, the stronger Reading became and were rewarded with a deserved equaliser. Oh, Stuart Lovell's volley finding a way through a crowd of players. For the second time in as many seasons, Reading had earned a cup draw at Main Road. More than 10,000 were at Elm Park for the second leg. Ranson, feeling got his head to the ball. Ranson now with a cross, looking for Lovell! Oh, he scored up at Main Road, and he could well have scored there. That was a terrific cross by the former Manchester City player, Ray Ranson. Spotted Lovell on the near post, and his header, thankfully for Manchester City, didn't trouble the goalkeeper. Phelan, Simpson, Phelan's forward again. Oh. Still Simpson. Quinn waiting patiently on the edge of the Reading penalty area. Oh, Lomas is still and in behind the Reading defence. And that's a goal for Manchester City. Steve Lomas makes it 1-0 just before half-time and gives Manchester City hope of making it to the next round. For once... Reading's defence was bypassed and Steve Lomas was strangely neglected inside the penalty area. What a terrific ball by McMahon to spot Steve Lomas unmarked and what a cool finish by a young player. Free kick to Reading, flicked on by Quinn. Oh, and Dibble almost lost it as Gooding went in for the kill. Dibble still out of his goal, and he sent it in! Reading have an equaliser, and who else but Jimmy Quinn steers Reading back towards safety. It's Reading 1, Manchester City 1. And Andy Dibble will have to shoulder some of the blame here. Why on earth he didn't retreat to his goal line after making the initial save, heaven only knows. But Jimmy Quinn was on the back post to head in his 11th goal of the season, and Paul Redding right back into this tie. And Jimmy Quinn, who else? The man who gives Redding hope. And the fans have something to celebrate at last. Dylan. Oh, there's problems here again for Manchester City. Quinn trying to turn in a very tight position. Kerr with a cross, it's a great ball in, Ranson, oh, and it was almost deflected in by Lovell. Really is down amongst the dead men at the moment, he's only just recovered from a rib injury, which uh, put him out of the Reading team. 
this could be a major blow to Reading. Here's the instant which caused the injury. It was a bump between Niall Quinn and Adrian Williams. And Williams came off worse. Quinn can't win it. A wild challenge by Fitzroy Simpson. Now here's Ray Ranson. Feeling back defending. It's a good cross too. Ray by Curl. Back to Ranson again. That's a poor ball in by Dylan. Good raid by Reading. Plenty of pressure. No real cutting edge to their attack. No final shot at the end of the move. This is feeling now for Manchester City. He's run fully 60 yards. Finds Niall Quinn, and that's a brilliant header and a brilliant goal, and Quinn has scored. Nine minutes from full time, and it's Niall Quinn who could well have won this game for Manchester City. Hasn't scored in his last four games, but pops up with a purposeful header here to swing the game Manchester City's way. I'm convinced that we lost the game really because we had to change our tactics as we did last season um, when Jeff Hopkins went off, Eddie Williams went off uh, tonight and that's cost us a game as far as I'm concerned. Back in the league, Hull City arrived at Elm Park as the division's leaders. Stuart Lovell was close to a stunning goal. Reading did score when Kevin Dillon's free kick was headed down by Jimmy Quinn and Jeff Hopkins' bravery earned him a place on the score sheet. In the second half, Hull forced an equaliser. Linton Brown's goal put an end to Reading's 100% home record. At Swansea, the Knights' goals both came in the second half. First, Andy McFarlane bundled the ball in for Swansea. The equaliser gave Uwe Hartenberger his first goal for the Royals. The £100,000 acquisition from Germany came off the substitutes bench and hit the target despite the angle. Reading's next league match was the highest scoring game they were involved in all season. Jimmy Quinn hit the first in a game of 10 goals. With the Royals' defence appealing for offside, Ronnie Jepson made it one all. When Mick Gooding's shot was only parried by the goalkeeper, Stuart Lovell knocked in Reading second. And courtesy of Exeter keeper Andy Gosney, Lovell strolled in another. Gosney was carried off injured and his replacement hadn't touched the ball before Scott Taylor made it 4-1 at half-time. Alan Ball's team battled back, Mike Ross scored with a header. And then Ross broke clear to make it 3-4. The Royals' defence were again looking for offside when Jepson tied the scores at 4 all. But Exeter's hopes of staging the comeback of the season were dashed by a wonderful strike by Quinn. Near the end, Gooding created another opening and Scott Taylor rounded off the scoring. There'd been more than enough of that for one day. Leighton Orient had the misfortune of feeling the full force of Jimmy Quinn's scoring power. He struck 10 goals in October alone. Just after half-time, Quinn pounced to make it 2-0. Reading had defender Adrian Williams sent off for a save most keepers would have been proud of. And then Shaka Hislop made an even better save to keep out Colin West's penalty. West did get one back for the O's, but it was too little too late. In the Autoglass Trophy, Reading were drawn in a first round group with Brighton and Fulham. At the Goldstone, Gavin Geddes curled in the opening goal. There were only a thousand faithful supporters watching. Geddes followed up his first goal for the Seagulls 
by setting up Kurt Nogan for a second. But Jimmy Quinn, who'd been rested, came off the substitutes bench to rescue Reading. From Mark Holtzman's centre, his second made it Brighton 2, Reading 2. At Vale Park, Reading produced one of the season's outstanding results in any division. Stuart Lovell struck the first. From Kevin Dillon's pass, Scott Taylor turned his man and beat the keeper for a second. Then Jimmy Quinn, as sure as ever from the penalty spot. And finally, an excellent piece of work by Lovell provided the prolific Quinn with his second. In four successive games, he'd scored twice. A result to savour. Back at Elm Park, the chances came and went against Fulham. Almost inevitably, it was Quinn who broke the deadlock. This time, a near post header brought Reading the points. His striking partners went close, but Quinn was again Reading's star man. So, Reading was second, just a point behind Stockport. Burnley, seven points back in third. Reading's unbeaten league run stretched to eight games, and much of the praise deservedly went to Quinn. He'd struck 20 goals by the end of October. His all-round contribution is top class. I mean, he's a, he's a player who's um, of a quality above this league, you know. Um, and I know I mean no disrespect to the other players playing in this league, but Jim, he's playing at international level and he yeah. still is. He's in phenomenal form and he's a he's a very good all-round player. He doesn't miss many chances, you know. He has chances, but um, any of the, uh, the, the, the sort of the, the sort of 50-50 ones that can be missed, he seems to be putting away. Uh, no doubt there'll come a stage in the season when he'll miss a few. All, stri all strikers go through that period, but uh, at the moment, everything that comes Jimmy way, he's con Jimmy's way. Is converting. The following midweek, Reading were in Yorkshire. When Jeff Hopkins hit the bar, Stuart Lovell snapped up the rebound. Lovell had just signed a new two year contract. On the evidence of this goal, he looked a good investment. It was his tenth of the season. But Rotherham weren't finished. From Des Hazel's centre, Ray Ranson turned the ball past Shaka Hislop. And 11 minutes from the end, Neil Whitworth headed an equaliser. A two-goal lead had been squandered, but Reading had earned another away point and stayed second in the league. Mark McGee received the Manager of the Month award for October before the game with Blackpool. In front of a 6,500 Elm Park crowd, the Seasiders took the lead when Brian Griffith squeezed a shot past Shaka Hislop. Reading had to settle for a draw. Jimmy Quinn tapped in the equaliser. In their second group match in the Autoglass, a solitary goal was enough to give Reading a passage to round two. Dylan Kerr, on as a substitute, forced the ball forward and Scott Taylor supplied the finish. And Taylor earned three more league points with this delicate lob at Brighton. It took Reading to the top of the table. Reading went out of the FA Cup at the hands of Cambridge before Bournemouth arrived at Elm Park. The Cherries were picked off with three second-half goals. Jimmy Quinn, the first. Mick Gooding smashed in the second with a first-time volley. That before Quinn's lazy-looking but stunningly effective lob made it 3-0. Breathtaking finishing gave Quinn the 150th goal of his career. Northampton were Reading's second-round opponents in the autoglass. Dylan Kerr was the architect of victory. From his centre, Uwe Hartenberger steered in the first goal. Hartenberger's second goal for Reading.
Jimmy Quinn made it 2-0 before half time. And then after the break, Kerr hit the upright with a free kick. But James Lambert nipped in for his only goal of the season. Another Kerr pass set up the fourth. Mick Gooding with a header. Northampton didn't leave without a goal. Martin Aldridge, their marksman, Reading were in round three. Reading's outstanding away form continued in front of an 11,000 crowd at Turf Moor. Mick Gooding headed the game's only goal. The result was marred for Reading by the dismissal of John Humphrey. The fullback on loan from Crystal Palace alleged to have used his elbow on Les Thompson. Burnley also lost a player. Adrian Heath received a red card for kicking the ball away. Heath astonished, Reading marched on. Goalkeeper Steve Francis played at Elm Park for the first time since joining Huddersfield. He rode his luck when first Scott Taylor and then Mick Gooding hit the woodwork. It was the first goalless draw of the season at Elm Park, thanks to a flying save from Shaka Hislop. More than 11,000 packed into Elm Park for the Christmas holiday match with rivals Stockport. Reading's Boxing Day game at Bristol Rovers had been postponed and the Royals looked sharper than ever. The first half performance was exceptional. Dylan Kerr to Stuart Lovell for the opening goal. Scott Taylor's run unsettled a less than convincing Stockport defence Typically, Lovell's movement off the ball gave him some space, and he added a confident finish. Back from injury in style, two of the most important goals Lovell scored all season. Stockport rarely threatened. When they did, Shaka Hislop was equal to it. The bank holiday crowd went home satisfied. We passed the ball very well, and uh, I missed a couple of chances to perform my goals, but... I persevered and I was, I was glad they came at the right time. The first was uh, a ball from Dylan Kerr. He had tried to thread a few in and I had a first touch and Scott Taylor had had a similar chance and had taken too long. So I thought, well, I'll just hit it straight away uh, and managed to tuck it away in the corner. The second one was a, was a nicer one. It was a, a very good ball through from Scott, Scott Taylor and I think they were trying to play offside and suddenly I, the, the, the space opened up on the right, but I was determined to, to have a crack. And, um, that was a better goal, that was quite a nice finish, I was pleased with that one. That result took Reading into the new year, seven points clear of Stockport. At the end of the season, the manager reflected on how satisfying that victory over Stockport had been. The performance against Stockport was the best, especially in the first half. It was the best performance since I've been here. It was really, I mean, it was outstanding, it was absolutely a joy to behold. It was everything that Colin and I had, had tried to get through to the players and to do it in a game as important as the Stockport game was fantastic. Reading spent New Year's Day at Cardiff and from the moment Jimmy Quinn's header rebounded off the post, it all went badly wrong. Cohen Griffith, Mark Azelwood and Nick Richardson scored Cardiff's goals as Reading suffered their worst defeat of the season. An unbeaten run of 15 league games was over. Two days later, though, Reading were back on track. Jimmy Quinn's free kick found a way through the wall. In fact, Reading scored all three goals that afternoon. York drew level when the ball bounced off Jeff Hopkins and passed Shaka Hislop. The manager wasn't too happy, but no one was complaining when another good move brought the winning goal. Quinn again the scorer. Mark McGee's progress at Reading didn't surprise one of his former managers. He's a good pedigree as a, a player to get into football management. And he is an intelligent lad and he's got a determination to succeed. Uh, and I think these are the things that you should always remember. That's the best advice of going on what your own strengths are. And I think that's showing itself at the moment. Ferguson was McGee's boss at Aberdeen and both won championships this season. Ferguson has an admirer at Elm Park. 
if you go there, it's awesome, you know. For me, it's like one of the eighth wonders of the world, you know. It's a fantastic place to be and a fantastic place to see football being played and to sit there on the, the, the sort of podium that he's got built for himself as the manager's sort of uh, lookout. Uh, it must be, you know, a bit of the sort of Caesars about it, you know. It must be a fantastic feeling and obviously any, um, any ambitious manager would like to experience that. The great thing for Reading is that it's not often they're at the top of the league. It's new for them new for a lot of their players, new for their supporters. So I think that's a great motivation in itself. And I'm sure that um, Mark will be using that to the full. A former Reading player, Mick Tate, committed the foul which led to Reading's first against Hartlepool. The drive from Jimmy Quinn, unstoppable. Adrian Williams, Quinn and Mick Gooding were involved in the second. The finish from Stuart Lovell was quite superb. Lovell taking the ball over his shoulder first time. Another Quinn free kick led to the third. Mick Gooding snapped up the rebound. Dylan Kerr's pass and Scott Taylor's finish rounded off a satisfying afternoon for the Elm Park crowd. Fulham and Reading, together in the first round group in the autoglass, met again in round three. A goal by Peter Barr was enough to give the Londoners victory. This trip to London did earn the Royals some reward. Stuart Lovell capitalised on the defender's mistake and scored in front of the Royals' travelling supporters. Orient equalised when the ball ricocheted off Jimmy Quinn. Uwe Hartenberger was the hero of this day. He was sent on as a substitute with Reading struggling to make the breakthrough. But when Jeff Hopkins surged forward, Hartenberger was on hand to deliver the winning goal. It's meant Reading had been unbeaten in league games at Elm Park for 12 months. Play 24, 120, drawn four. Rovers scored first in the rearranged match at Twerton Park. Billy Clark with the header. In an ill-tempered match, Rovers had Marcus Browning sent off. Reading then equalised with a penalty. The offender, Clark, who bundled Jimmy Quinn to the ground. The division's top marksman put away the penalty himself. Reading were also down to 10 men when, just two minutes after coming on as a substitute, Uwe Hartenberger was adjudged to have used his elbow. It hardly looked intentional. Another Royal saw red at Craven Cottage. Mick Gooding clashed with Fulham's Duncan Jupp. Gooding sent off for the first time in 15 years as a professional. The Fulham fullback was also dismissed. The closest Reading came to a goal was a shot from Phil Parkinson. But five minutes from time, Gary Brazil laid the ball off for Julian Hales to hit the goal, which gave Fulham the points. Reading's outstanding home run was finally broken by Port Vale. Martin Foyle gave Vale an early lead. This was the first occasion in the season that Reading lost a second successive match. Vale were two up within ten minutes. Bernie Slaven clipped the ball across goal to provide Kevin Kent with a simple task. In the second half, there were signs of a Reading revival. Kevin Dillon's determination earned a penalty. The reliable Jimmy Quinn drove Reading back into the match. And Quinn went close to claiming a draw. 
so Reading faced their longest journey, anxious to avoid three in a row. Ian McGookin's header certainly didn't help the Royals fans enjoy half-time. The day demanded an effective response, and it was supplied by Stuart Lovell, on as a substitute for the injured Adrian Williams. His strike made it one apiece. Then Mick Gooding teed up Scott Taylor. Relief for the Royals fans. With just three minutes left, super sub Lovell made it 3-1. And in the final few seconds, Taylor broke down the right. Tony Witter left the ball for sharpshooter Jimmy Quinn to make it Hartlepool 1, Reading 4. More than 9,000 at Elm Park saw David Thompson put Brentford in front. Jimmy Quinn had the supporting role in the equaliser. His goal-bound chip cleared only as far as Jeff Hopkins. And then in the 89th minute, Quinn again centre stage. An acrobatic, athletic, accurate volley gave Reading a valuable victory. At Cambridge, Steve Butler had two golden opportunities to make Reading suffer. But on both occasions, goalkeeper Shaka Hislop outwitted the striker. And then, to punish United still further, the goal poacher Supreme smashed in the decisive goal. After setbacks against Fulham and Port Vale, three successive victories had again lifted Reading ten points clear. Rovers were now second. FA Cup commitments were contributing to a fixture backlog for Plymouth and particularly Stockport. Shaka Hislop, the only player to appear in every game this season, made a spectacular save against Wrexham. But the Welshman became the first and only team to complete a league double over Reading this season when Barry Hunter headed home. When the result is long forgotten, this match will be remembered for two other incidents. Tony Witter broke his leg in that challenge with Carl Connolly. It was also the match where Adrian Williams completed a record, having worn every possible shirt number in a season. But Witter was the man of the match, even though he played for half an hour with a broken leg. Uh, with the throw. That was Naylor up above him. And now Castle knocking it forward. And Hislop playing it straight to Nugent. And Kevin Nugent puts Plymouth Argyle in front. His 14th of the season and they don't come much easier than this. Hislop hitting it straight into his midriff. And there was Nugent tucking it past him and the goalkeeper buries his head in the ground. Now a chance for Kerr to break. He's got to round the Argyle defence. Looking to chip it over Nichols towards the goal, and it's there. A superb goal from Dylan Kerr, who takes his shirt off in celebration, as well he might. He's threatened on a couple of occasions already this half, got away, and then just kept his head, saw Nichols coming out, waited, just picked his spot, and then, despite Dominic Naylor's efforts, got the ball into the far corner. One all. To... Uh, Interesting hand signals. Mark McGee having a few words to say. And Colin Lee getting a bit animated as well. Now McCall finding Dalton. Burnett looking for some support and getting it from Naylor. The crowd not happy. I feel Argyle should be a little more route one, I think. Well, Naylor does get the cross in now towards Nugent. Falls for Dalton. Dalton with a shot. And Paul Dalton puts Plymouth Argyle in front. Well, the fans here celebrate as well they might. The ball played back to him on the edge of the area. He's not getting a hand to it, but he couldn't stop it. And the coming getting forward as Burnett floats the ball into the box. And Hislop comes for it, doesn't get it. Nugent, it's the post and it's in. And Kevin Nugent makes it 3-1. And surely Plymouth Argyle will be favourites to win this promotion showdown at home park now.
Well, Burnett floating the free kick in. Hislop came for it, didn't get to it. The ball fell to Nugent on the far post for his second goal of the game. After the setback at home park, Reading began brightly against Bradford. Stuart Lovell's rising drive put Reading in command. But they failed to capitalise. Several chances were squandered on a night when Reading slipped from the top of Division 2. In the second half, Lee Power, who just joined Bradford from Norwich, saw his shot find a way past Shaka Hislop. Reading only gave up the top spot for four days. If there was increasing pressure on McGee's team, it certainly didn't affect Jimmy Quinn's finishing. He completed his tenth double of the season. Dean Windass scored a penalty for the Tigers, but Reading rose back to the top of the pack. I try to make it a kind of nervous day, you know, make it different from other days because it's not like other days, it is a match day. It's the most important day of the of the week for us. It's the, the thing that we've all worked for. We train all week, uh, no matter what you do at training, it's all about what happens on a Saturday. So you've got to try and instill some sort of difference and some sort of feeling into Saturdays. And I try and do that by by, by building up the atmosphere and by trying to make people a little bit nervous and, uh, and, and it works. In those days we get there at quarter to two and I've got one thing in my head and Colin's got another. Uh, uh, we've got three or four different options we've left it on a Friday. We've both been turning it over in our minds overnight. 99% of the, 100% uh, of the time actually, we eventually come to a conclusion that we agree on. Yes, would you? Two players have not arrived yet. Two players are late, so Shaka Hislop and Keith McPherson receive a warm welcome. <laughs> We can, hey, we can do this easily, or we can do it. Please help me, Jordy. Jordy did say 50, but I'm not sure. 20. You won't believe how quickly it will look so different if we win the next two games. We win the next two games, or suddenly you see daylight. At the moment you're saying we still will need all those points, you get then towards single figures and it suddenly looks a lot, lot easier. So let's make sure that we give it everything to do. I think I play and uh, include Colin in it a vital role, you know. I mean, I get shouts from the behind the dugout, oh, sit down, McGee, and all that stuff, you know. And I've got to ignore that because the players know, and I know that we have a very important role to play from the side, reminding people of their jobs, pointing out things that maybe we hadn't seen in other teams, we watch other teams, but maybe they're doing something or someone's playing somewhere or doing something that we hadn't anticipated and maybe one of our team or some of our team hasn't noticed it. And let's see you when the ball's getting knocked over the top and you're running out there, don't worry about keeping possession and coming out and playing. If the ball's back forward down there, then if he doesn't spin in behind us to get an end, if we'll ask him what. Jokes. You've got to start. You've done nothing. Yes. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Now we've got Jonesy and Ryder sitting in the bench chanting to go on. Well, we want to see you down there where we can get the ball you your feet. We're winning the throw in. We're getting the last start, and then you can do your stuff. So as soon as we win the ball, let's see you look to go forward. It's the thing we said the other week. You go forward. We're running, you're running this way. You're running this way all the time when we've got the ball. If they get the ball, we expect you to run back. When we've got the ball, we want you to try and get forward, not try to get back towards it to get the ball. The half-time team talk was barely over when Jason Bowen gave Swansea the lead. But just as the manager demanded at half-time, Michael Jilks began taking on defenders. His reward, a penalty, converted by Jimmy Quinn. And when Stuart Lovell weighed in with the winning goal, the satisfaction around Elm Park was complete. All week we train for the game. When you win the game, you've done your job. Um, when you win it and you did feel you deserve to win it and done it in a, in a reasonably good way, then you get all the more satisfaction. As you've said, other results have went for us. We're six points clear at the top of the league and really, um, I'll enjoy my, uh, my, well, not caviar, but... I'm sure the chairman will buy me something nice. 
As the manager said, Reading was six points clear. Plymouth was second. Stockport, four points further back with three games in hand. York were on a roll when Reading arrived at Bootham Crescent and Gary Swan headed the only goal of the night. A push on Scott Taylor earned Reading a penalty. But Jimmy Quinn's first penalty miss of the season was high and not very handsome. But Rovers felt the full force of the mighty Quinn. The 34-year-old produced another finish of the highest quality. In the second half, Dylan Kerr set up a second for Stuart Lovell. Reading on course for another victory when Michael Jilts was on the receiving end of the season's worst challenge at Elm Park. Billy Clark really couldn't complain about the red card. Cardiff arrived battling for points to avoid relegation. Reading scored first, pace and accuracy giving Michael Jilts his first goal since September. In terrible weather, Reading were close to further goals. But Cardiff left with a point when Jeff Hopkins, under pressure, steered the ball past Shaka Hislop. The conditions at Barnet were even worse. The North London club, who were already relegated, battled all the way. But Stuart Lovell's shot just made it through the mud. Reading's penultimate home game was a frustrating affair for the Elm Park crowd. It finished goalless. And it could have been worse for Reading as Paul Hurst hit the crossbar. So Reading began the final lap. Four matches left, three of them including the rearranged game with Stockport away from home. And Stockport still had two games in hand. On the day Stockport were held by Cardiff, Reading were impressive winners. A right foot drive from Dylan Kerr was celebrated in traditional shirt overhead style. Blackpool were another club fighting for second division survival, but Reading had the mark of champions. Stuart Lovell turned in the second, and his pace sent him clear again. A cool finish took Archie's goal tally for the season to 22. Jimmy Quinn's drive made it 4-0 on a day the Blackpool supporters applauded Reading from the park. Stockport desperately needed all three points and giant striker Kevin Francis headed them in the right direction. But this was an evening when Reading displayed plenty of grit and determination. The division's top marksmen both had chances. Kevin Francis came within inches of adding a second. But Reading's second half performance deserved a reward. It came from Jimmy Quinn's centre and was finished by Mick Gooding. And so back to Elm Park. Victory over Brighton would guarantee promotion. Elm Park's biggest crowd of the season expected. Jimmy Quinn delivered. Now oh, there's put me danger here towards Quinn! That's suddenly it now! The second goal sparked not only the promotion party, but Reading were confirmed as champions. These things live in your memory. Uh, the young players, even the players I've been through before, you know, will, will never forget these scenes. You know, and people in Reading that were on that pitch today and ran on at the second goal will, 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 will remember it and enjoy remembering it. You know, and th these are great things about, uh, about success. You've been through this before, of course, haven't you? Yeah, um, it's my second championship medal for the club and um, 
I'm ecstatic about it, to be honest. That hasn't really sunk in yet. Brilliant, brilliant. 11,000, whatever it was today, and uh, you know, super finale to the great season. I'm pleased for the town of Reading as well. I know they realise that we've worked hard this season, and I think they appreciated it. It showed today, and I just thought next season will come down, and they'll show that appreciation starting from the first game uh, until next season, 95. I must admit, when Quinny's goal went in, I mean, it was it was just a, a, a an absolutely fantastic feeling for everyone, and uh, I mean, the crowd and everything coming on there. I mean, that's just part of the day. The press has been on all season. We've been the top of the league all season, and when you're up the top, it's just as bad as being at the bottom. Everybody's trying to knock you off it, and. All credit to Lars, we, we've done tremendously well, we've had some great results, uh, certainly away from home, we've got the best record in all the divisions away, and uh, we just finished it off today. I think we've played very, very well for, for probably 90% of our games, we haven't let too many people down, it was just, uh, you know, it wasn't the best of games today, but it was just a case of getting the, the three points and, and relaxing. This has been my debut season, full, full season of professional, to win a championship has exceeded my wildest expectations. You're not going to be thinking if it happened in your first season that it's going to be like this every season. Well, uh, being realistic, I know that it can't. So, but you know, keep our fingers crossed. Hope for some success next season, and we take it from there. Not surprisingly, there was a relaxed atmosphere in training before the final game at Bournemouth. There was time to reflect on a season of achievement. I think that, um, I, I don't know, no matter how well we go on and do as a management team, Colin and I, and whatever we win, championships or cups or whatever, I don't think that there can possibly ever be a season that went so much to plan. It just, you know, everything was, you know, more or less as we designed it and as we anticipated and as we planned for. And uh, it's just really worked out, um, as I say, exactly as, 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 as hoped. It's been the most enjoyable season I've ever had in football and I think um, every credit must go to all the players and the staff because we've done it on a small squad. In other words, people have played, played on with injuries which if you were playing for a bigger squad you wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have played with at times. And you know, so I don't think people realise that there's been a lot of effort that way put in this season. Looking forward to Division 1? Yeah, it'll be nice back playing in there. It's, uh, it's a hard league, there's no easy games in that league uh, and it'll be a big test for us. The final competitive action was at Dean Court. Steve Fletcher gave the Cherries the lead. The notable statistic of the night for Reading, the goal, another exemplary finish from the maestro, Jimmy Quinn. It was his 40th in a quite outstanding season. Dylan Kerr was Reading's player of the season. The fans will forgive the sloppy pass which led to Bournemouth's winner for Steve Cotterell. It's a marvellous goal. Reading were already the champions. And these are the final positions which will survive in football's records. Reading 89 points from 46 games, the champions. And Port Vale secured the second automatic promotion place with 88 points. Adrian Williams' outstanding season was recognised by Wales. The defender became the first player to graduate from being a trainee at Elm Park to international football while still at Reading. Keith McPherson collected the trophy. The players received their championship medals before a celebration match against Genoa. Driving rain wasn't likely to spoil this party. For more than 5,000 royal supporters at Elm Park and thousands more across the country, it was a day to remember.
It's a great moment for everyone, uh, the fans, everyone's turned out a miserable day, unfortunately. But, uh, yes, uh, this is just the, uh, you know, obviously what we've been working for all season. It's a great moment for us all. The lads are loving it. I mean, it's been a hard season, but everyone's really worked hard and they've done really well. I mean, it's unbelievable at the moment. Like, we're just enjoying it. Tremendous finale to what has been a hard-working season. I know that a lot of us here at the club have been on tenterhooks now for a very long time indeed, you know, getting those extra points. And, you know, when there's an enormous amount of pressure being at the top of the division, but to actually to get the accolade of actually not only getting into the first division, but winning the championship is just absolutely wonderful. Do you feel that it's justified your faith that you put into this football club a couple of years ago? Absolutely, but it's, um, as I keep saying, it's a team effort. I mean, uh, the team on the pitch, off the pitch, I mean, uh, the fans. Um, there's a lot of people who worked endlessly to, to get us to this position. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, with all the amount of support we're getting you know, from the media and indeed uh, the Reading Borough Council and police, etc., the more people will take notice of Reading Football Club and we can go on to greater things. We've got an awful lot of work to do in the closed season, as you might imagine, but I'm sure that we'll be up there with the best of them, and um, who knows, in a, a year or two's time, we may be even sort of playing Premier football, football in the area, which would be absolutely terrific.